He is an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. Uh, he is a co our former co-director of Light Bears Ministries. That's probably how many of you know him. He's been on 3ABN uh, for many years, and he's been involved in a series called, if I can get this right, Salvation in Symbols and Signs. Uh, he is also the author of a book called The Messiah, or I'm sorry, it's just Messiah. And it's about, it basically proves that Jesus is who he says he is. From the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, it's a Bible study on the 70-week prophecy and how it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. And when you read that book, skepticism just disappears, that Jesus truly is who he says that he is. Uh, we're going to pick up that book at, at uh, White, White Horse Media, so if anybody's interested in checking that out, uh, we will have that shortly. James is married to Reese, 31 years. 31 years, happily married. His son is JL, his daughter is Kiera, and he informed me that he has uh, two dogs named Luke and Duke, and a cat named Alfie, is that right? I don't know, is Alfie short for alfalfa or just Alfie? Alfred, oh, short for Alfred. Okay, and he's, uh, his final talk here is called Follow the Lamb. And uh, right before James comes up and speaks to us, uh, Nivelle is going to sing another song. I don't know what song it is. I asked him earlier, I said, Nivelle, give me the title of the song before uh, James speaks. And he said, I'm not sure I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lead me. So we'll see what that is. And I do know that at the end of James's talk, he's going to sing a song which I absolutely love. Uh, it's on the Look Up CD and it's called All Things New. And it looks forward to the time when sin will be gone and all evil and the devil will be behind us and God is gonna make everything brand new, which is what we're all looking forward to. And at the end, uh, White Horse Media has some material out there on the table and Nivelle has his CDs out there. You're welcome to take a look at them and if you want them, uh, they are there. And then when we're all done, we're gonna have a season of prayer. We're going to kneel together and just pray because we don't want, you know, we don't want this just to be theory. Uh, we want it to be personal. <laughs> As we've just heard uh, Nivelle's testimony, it's personal between God and us. So we will, we will pray before we finish. So Nivelle, look forward to your uh, second to the last song and then your last song after James speaks to us called Follow the Lamb. That uh, by the time I'm finished with this song, you would have memorized it and can join me. It goes like this. Be thou faithful unto death, and you shall receive, yes, you shall receive. Oh, be thou faithful unto death, and you shall receive, yes, you shall receive. Of life. He that is humble shall be exalted. He that is proud, the same shall be cast down. And he that will find his life shall lose it, but for my sake. If you lose your life, you'll find it. Be thou faithful unto death, and you shall receive. Yes, you shall receive. Oh, be thou faithful unto death, and you shall receive. Oh, yes, you shall receive. Crown of life. He that will love his mother and his father. 
more than he loves me is not worthy of me he that confesses me before his brethren i will confess him before my father faithful unto death and you shall receive oh yes you shall receive oh be thou faithful unto death and you shall receive oh yes you shall receive a crown of life this is my favorite part here That endureth trials and tribulation shall have a right to the tree of life and he that will run this race to the finish shall also reign with me in my kingdom so See if we can sing it together now. Be thou faithful unto death, and you shall, and you shall receive. Oh, yes, you shall receive. Oh, be thou faithful unto death, and you shall, and you shall receive. Oh, yes, you shall receive a crown of life. Let's sing it again. Nice and loud. Come on. Be thou. Y'all sound great. Ring it out. Ring it out. And you. Oh, yes, you shall. Oh, be thou. And you shall receive. Oh, yes, you shall receive a crown. Turn to the person next to you. We're going to sing it one more time. Oh, be thou faithful unto death. Oh, yes. Oh, be thou faithful unto death. And you shall. And you shall receive. Oh, yes, you shall. A crown of life. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Music is powerful, isn't it? I was thinking about that in relation to the book of Revelation which happens to be my favorite book of the Bible. I don't know if anyone else shares that love. And I was thinking about all of the emphasis in the book of Revelation on song and singing. You know, it seems like a lot of the prophecies in Revelation are interrupted by songs. And it used to bother me when I first started reading Revelation. I was like, let's get to the, the meat Let's get to the prophecies. Let's get to end time events. Why are we singing another song? <laughs> Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 7, and, you know. And, uh, but now I realize that that is the meat. That is the meat. That, that is the strength. You know, when God's people anciently were faced with enemies, when they were surrounded, when they were overwhelmed, when they were beaten and put in jail, when they were struggling just to, to hold on, they would sing. They would sing these songs of faith, and God would come to their rescue. I was thinking about that in relation to the hymnal. One day I just want to preach out of the hymnal, you know, just preach out of the hymnal, because these hymns are so powerful, and there's, there's so many powerful stories behind so many of them, and I don't know the story behind this one, but this is 508, and I just want to read a little bit of this here. It says, anywhere, 
with Jesus. I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. And then the question is asked, anywhere? And then the statement is made with an exclamation mark, anywhere. Fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Even the book of Revelation. Can we go into the book of Revelation with Jesus? Because, you know, a lot of Christians will read the Bible dutifully and then they'll get to the book of Revelation and they'll do a 180. Like, that book is not a place that I feel like I can go. I don't want to land with all the dragons and the beasts. I don't want to be in a book that's full of symbols that I don't understand. And yet it's, it's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And this weekend, which has been such a blessing to me personally, I'm so glad I came. And honestly, if I'm going to be honest with you, Steve talked me into giving a meeting here. I just wanted to come up and just kind of take it all in. You know, pastors need that sometimes. We just need to drink in some spiritual stuff, and I've been needing that for a while. And, but Steve, you know, I don't know if you know Steve really well, but yeah, <laughs> I don't need to say any more. And we're old friends. And this weekend, we've been looking at Revelation 13 and 14, and I, I find that, that when you look at that, these chapters, because this is the center of the crisis, the controversy. I mean, this is where, you know, it's really going to hit us hard. And, and a lot of us are a little bit intimidated by this. But, but when you look at Revelation 13 and 14, when you look at it in the context of Jesus, it, everything changes. Have you noticed that? It all changes. Revelation 14 is really powerful. And I just want to look at one little phrase here in Revelation 14. I've got my old... Uh, King James Version, and I like this Bible because it has removable pages, you know, you don't, the newer, newer Bibles don't have that, I don't know if you've ever, so there's these old Bibles, they have advantages, and there's a lot of, a lot of benefit to this, because I can walk around and still read the Bible without carrying the, Revelation 14 verse 4, just one little phrase here, these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever, that's King James language there, I love that, whithersoever he goeth. And I really think that's our issue. I really do. I mean, we can talk about all kinds of other things, and we can get sidetracked with conspiracy theories, and we can, you get into a lot of issues that are taking place, but I think the bottom line for us is how do we follow Jesus wherever he goes. Because anywhere with Jesus I can safely go and fear I cannot know. But how do we do that? God has always given instruction to his people from day one, Adam and Eve, don't mess with the tree in the Garden of Eden. That one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't mess with that. Noah, build an ark and tell everyone who will listen to get on this ark. I mean, just I don't want just you and your family on it. I want the birds. I want the animals. I want everything, everyone on this ark. Lot, get out and take as many as your family members with you. Abraham, Jacob, Israel, Mary, Joseph. Go into Egypt. The wise men, don't go back to Herod. Jesus. His disciples, even Christ as a man, was always guided by the Father safely through his life. And that's what God wants for each one of us. He's not going to leave us alone in the end of time. We're not going to be fending for ourselves. God's never been that way. He's always cared, not just for his people, but for all people. He's always into second chances, and he's longing for us to take refuge, the refuge that we have in the Lamb. So tonight, I'd like us to just try to understand what this verse means to us. How it is that we follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Let's just pause and pray together. Father in heaven, thank you again this evening 
for promising to fill our hearts with your word, with instruction. Thank you for every person that's here, man, woman, child. Thank you for putting it on our hearts to come together. Thank you for putting it on Steve's heart and the ministry of Whitehorse to to have this event. We need it. We felt your spirit moving, speaking to us, touching our hearts. You've been you've been reviving us. And we don't want to just be revived. We want to be reformed. We want to be transformed. We want to know Jesus as our personal friend and savior. We want to follow him wherever he goes and we each one of us knows how much we follow him and each one of us is aware, I'm sure, of areas we don't. But perhaps there's some of us here that aren't aware, and perhaps there's areas where we need to grow. I know we all do. And Father, tonight, as we close out this weekend, we're just asking that you will please speak to us about those areas individually, that you'll bring your words to us personally through your Holy Spirit, to me and to each one of us, and that you'll help us to remember how you love us and how you have been guiding us in every generation of people and how you long to guide this generation, not just us, but every person listening, every person that we will be in contact with, that you want to guide them safely past the beast, past the dragon, through the seven last plagues, and into the city of God. So do that for us again tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation is my favorite book of the Bible. And God gave us the book of Revelation for a specific reason. Right in Revelation chapter 1, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. It couldn't get any plainer than that. And from the time it was written all the way down to our time, God has been showing us through the book of Revelation, his servants, his people, and through them, whoever will listen, things which must shortly come to pass. That's why we understand Revelation as as a historicist interpretation. Because there's prophecy in there that has been for the early church and then coming all the way down to our time, past, present, and future. We understand it that way, and it helps us to realize not just how the book is written, but that God's heart cares for all people in all time. He hasn't just written this all for the end of time or for the last generation. He cares about every single generation of people. The book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus, not just a revelation of knowledge. It's a revelation of who he is and how God cares for his people. What a book, and what a revelation. You know, we've heard some very important counsel in this seminar. And I've noticed, I don't know if you have, because I've got a sensitivity to this, that with all of the knowledge and information that we've been listening to, every single speaker without exception has always come back to Christ. Have you noticed that? Every single time. And I really believe that that is key for us in these last days. Not just for us personally, but for us as we minister and witness to others. Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says in John 12, 32, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all unto me. And if you don't lift up Jesus, you're going to have to do all the drawing. And sometimes we rely upon ourselves to draw people to Christ because we don't lift him up. Our job is to lift up Christ. The, the, the work of the pastor is to make it across country to Calvary as fast as possible. So, no matter how much biblical knowledge we have, no matter how much prophetic knowledge we have, no matter how well prepared we are for the end of time, economically, materially, in the right location. If we don't know Jesus as our personal Savior, all of that becomes insignificant. And we can see this in history. You look at the early church. You look at the disciples. They were 
devastated, decimated when Christ went to the cross. They were up in that room for fear of the Jews. But as they confessed their sins and their failures, which, by the way, most of their imperfections was based upon their theology. They thought Messiah is going to come set up an earthly kingdom and I want to be right on the right side and I want to be on the left side. And they were always contending for the highest place. Once they got that out of their system, once they saw Christ as Messiah sacrifice, and they realized that the highest place was at the foot of the cross, they began to pray, confess those sins, and the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. And you couldn't stop them. You couldn't beat them. You couldn't jail them. You couldn't starve them. You couldn't do anything to them to stop them from preaching Christ and Him crucified. So what are we afraid of? The only thing we need to fear is that we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we look at the end of time and we think, how am I going to get through that? Yeah, if you want to look at it from that perspective, Abraham said the same thing. How, am I, how is Sarah and I going to have a baby? I mean, look at us. I'm 75, 85 years old. There's no way I'm going to have a kid. It's impossible. But that's looking at it from a human perspective. When we look at it from God's perspective, it's just like, Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere? Anywhere. Fear I cannot know. So Revelation 13 focuses on the human element, the powers of the earth. And they look overwhelmingly powerful. I mean, when you look at what's happening in the world today and you realize, hey, this is USA, this is papacy, and you look at the agenda and, and how people are just like, just going along with it, you're thinking, what in the world? How do... And how are we going to ever... There's no way that we can... What are we going to do? And then you look at God's people, because Revelation 14 is a contrast between the powers of the world, which look overwhelming, and then God's people. And sometimes when you look at the powers of the world you th- you, you, and we look at things of the world, we think, well, we probably need to do things their way or take up a little bit of that. Or No, don't even think about it. God has given us instruction in Revelation chapter 14. This is what God's people are going to do when these powers are established. We're talking about what's going to happen when the mark of the beast is enforced. Well, we are going to follow the Lamb like we've never followed Him before. That's what Revelation 14 says. Those aren't my words. We're going to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. Right? And we think, well, yeah, but we're not going to be able to buy or sell. Praise God. Well, what do you mean, praise God? No more distractions. No more distractions. iPhones, gone. Video, media, gone. Twitter, Facebook, gone. Job conflict, gone. (laughs) Everything's gone. And we're like, how are we going to make it? I'm like, this is the help we need, friends. We need to have a different perspective on this. God is helping us to follow him with us wherever he goes because you know what gets in the way. My wife came to me several weeks ago and she said, man, she said, I've got to get up early. Er, she already gets up early enough. I've got to get up early, er. And I said, why? She says, I need to spend time with Jesus. I need to spend more time with Jesus. I'm meeting patients. I'm interacting with them. And some of them I'm praying with. Recently, she asked if she could pray with a lady who was a median, who taught, communicated with the dead. And she said, yes. The lady said, yes. And she prayed with this lady, and this lady began to cry, and she says, I've never had anyone pray with me before. I need to get up earlier, because I need to spend more time with Jesus. And I want to say, honey, that is so cool, and, and we just need to look forward to that time in Revelation 13 when you won't have a job anymore, and you can just spend all day with Jesus. You can, just, you can just soak it in. You can just, it can come in and then it goes out. And all we're doing is just reaching out to people. It's going to be a blessing to be cut off from the world. 
a complete blessing. We've got to look at it from a different perspective because what God is telling us is we need to transition to Revelation 14 even now. We need to take advantage of every moment of our time. Someone has said to me recently, and I totally relate to this, you know, they said, you've got this phone, you know, have you, read, have you watched that, that video by Scott about, you know, the media and all the stuff that this does to you or whatever? And I'm like, yeah, that's why I quit Facebook, I quit Twitter, I quit Instagram. But I said, there's, there's something else that I think is important, and I said, these devices can control us or we can control them. God will give us the power to control these. He will. But if you're sitting in church and God is speaking to you, and what I mean by that is someone's up front preaching from the Word of God. God is speaking to you. And your phone rings and you answer it, you're making a choice. Can you imagine if you were in a personal conversation with God and your phone rang and said, excuse me, (laughs) got to get this. It looks like it's my, uh, well, I don't know who it is, but, you know, they're calling me, so I must be important. When this phone interrupts your conversations, not just with God in church, but with people, then this phone is controlling you. Do you remember the day when phones were tied to the wall? Like you had an answering machine and there was this little red button went pop, 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 pop. You're like, oh, we got four calls. And you get home and you're like, we got four calls. Man, we must be important people. But now we've got it right in our hip pocket and we're like, if someone calls us, we're... It reminds me of the guy that was in the airport. You know, he's on his cell phone and he's walking around. This is when cell phones kind of first came out. He's walking around. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and everyone's just kind of looking at him. He's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden his phone rings. <laughs> it is... It is about ourselves. That's what it's about. But I think, personally, that we can control this device and we can utilize it for our benefit. It can help us to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. I have audio book. I have nine Spirit of Prophecy books on my phone. Right now I'm reading or listening to Patriarchs and Prophecy. I listen to all, most of the way over here I listen to that book. And then I'll go to Prophets and Kings, and then I'll go to the Desire of Ages, and then I'll go to Acts of the Apostles, and then I'll finish up with the Great Controversy. Because I don't think it's good enough for us to get up early in the morning and spend an hour with Jesus. I think we need to push him into every nook and cranny of our lives, because that's the way the devil's working. Have you noticed? I mean, it's just available. And it's not, it's not like it seems like it's wicked. It's just, it's kind of neutral. You know, we watch this stuff and it's kind of neutral, but we get hooked on it. And pretty soon it's just like the thing to do. Like as soon as Sabbath's over, we're just like in there, whether it's sports or whatever it is. And I feel like the same thing happens to me when I saturate my mind with the Word of God. I just want to keep going. I'm ready to push that button again and listen to the rest of the story. I was right in the middle of, you know, and I want to get back into it. That's the way our minds work. By beholding, we become changed. It's a law. Great Controversy 555, it's a law of our spiritual nature that by beholding, we become changed. And I think we should take advantage of these devices. I think we should take advantage of technology to squeeze the Word of God into every nook and cranny of our lives, to saturate our minds with God's words. Now, sometimes I just want to listen to music. Sometimes I just want to meditate. I just want to, I just want to think. I, don't, I, I just want some window time. I get in my car and I just want some window time, windshield time. And I just want to think. When I first got in my car on the way over here, I've got eight and a half hours to, to go to drive here. So, so when I first got in my car, I was just thinking and talking to God, just giving him thoughts. You know, I'm not like our father, you know, kneeling. It's you can talk to God anywhere, anytime. You could be driving like I was, and you're pulling up to next to a semi, and it's pouring down rain, and you know how those semis are, and that water's coming right at your windshield, and you're like, I can hardly see, Lord, please help me to get through this. Thank you. Just talk to him about anything, about everything. And you'll find at times that he will talk to you, and he'll just, he'll just say things to you. He'll just impress you. And that's, that's the relationship that God wants us to have with him. And I love this. It's so powerful. It's so beautiful. Simply put, God wants us to follow the Lamb. That's how God describes it. It's just simple language, divine inscription. 
But we make it so complicated, don't we? We want the Bible to be coined in deep theological terms. We want salvation to be complicated. And and many times as Christians who have been around for many years, we really want this secret knowledge to be something that no one else gets but the very elite. As if salvation is locked up in our universities or in only those people who spend all of their time studying. And yet, when you come to the last book, at least the book we've made last in the Bible, not the last one written, but the last one in the Bible, when you come to the last book, when you come to the last crisis of all the crises that God's people have ever faced, and when you get in that, in that final instruction that God is giving us, right there, the final instruction, He says, follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Follow the Lamb wherever you go. Could it be that simple? Could it be that simple? It was for me 35 years ago. I mean, I was raised Catholic. I was raised saying my prayers every night, whether I was drunk or sober. Our Father, Hail Mary, God bless the world, my mom, my sister. And then I encountered life. At its worst, some pretty bleak situations. And I didn't know Jesus as personal Savior. I knew these rote prayers. And sometimes I prayed them a lot, but they weren't meaningful to me. And someone, someone helped me to understand how to accept Jesus as my personal Savior. When I asked him into my heart, everything changed. There was this relationship and there was this, this expectation, this transformation that took place. And I couldn't get enough of the Word of God. I started studying with Adventists to get my sister out because I wasn't converted in Adventism. I was converted and connected with Calvary Chapel, and I thought my sister was getting into some kind of cult. So we started having Bible studies because I figured I'm going to figure out where these guys are off, and then I'll tell my sister and get her out. (laughs) And I told my Bible worker... After our first study, I said, could you bring two of those studies over next time? (laughs) Because I'd like, you know, one a week isn't enough. By the time we were halfway through the studies, I was going on Bible studies with her. Like we were going on Bible studies together. She said, you want to come with me? I said, yeah, I'd love to because I couldn't get enough. I was just hungry for the word of God. And it was transforming me. I remember I came home one day, you know, my sister told me to stop listening to rock and roll music, and I told her, it doesn't matter what li- music you listen to, you know. I, I love Jesus. I, I don't go to bars anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible. What does it matter what music you listen to? And I, I came home one day, and there was my drum set, and there was dust on my drums, and I thought, how did dust gather on my drums? <laughs> and I wiped it all off, and I went over to my stereo and grabbed my cassette. Sorry, young people, um, that's an old term for like a CD or a DVD. <laughs> cassette, and I put it in the cassette player, and cassettes aren't like, you know, CDs where you can just flip to the song you want. You have to go through the whole reel, like the whole thing before you get there, right? And I was trying to figure out what side to listen to. I was going through the songs. It was Van Halen, and one of the songs was Running with the Devil. And I thought, I'm not running with the devil. And I did something that my sister couldn't convince me to do. I did something that the church couldn't convince me to do. I took my hundred cassettes, rock and roll favorites. I took the whole case outside and I dumped it in the garbage can. Not because I had to, not because the church told me to, but because I wanted to. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look long in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And Satan knows that's the secret. He knows that. And so look what he's done with our world. Look what's going on. We are just inundated, aren't we? Everywhere we go, everywhere we turn. The rock and roll music I used to listen to is now in the grocery store. (laughs) Like, whoa, that's a song my mom told me I couldn't listen to. And now I'm, I'm listening to it while I'm buying vegetables. It's amazing how Satan is infiltrated how the standards have come lower and lower and lower and how difficult it's going to be for us in the end of time to hold to these biblical truths unless we follow Jesus. Unless we follow Jesus. 
Now, there are a lot of ways that the Bible illustrates this truth. But I'd like to look at a story that's found in the book of Luke. It's in Luke chapter 10. And I'd like to look at this story not just for its value as part of the theme we're talking about, but I'd also like to look at it in the context of Revelation chapters 13 and 14. Because I think the book of Revelation has been misunderstood in this way. That a lot of times when we read the book of Revelation, we don't really think it's connected with the rest of the Bible. Like we think there's a disconnect. Like there's the Bible and there's the Gospels and there's all this. And then there's the book of Revelation. Like that's, what a weird, like strange book, you know. And I'd like to suggest that the book of Revelation is really a summation of the entire Bible. Like in the book of Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. I'd like to suggest that, that really Revelation, even though it's symbolic, is just summarizing the same principles, the same truths that are written all through the Scripture. So I'd like us, when you read, try this, when you read the Old and especially the New Testament, try to connect some of those stories to the book of Revelation. That's what we'll do tonight in Luke chapter 10. We'll connect this story to the book of Revelation. Now, just to give a little overview of what's happening here, first of all, in Luke chapter 10, you have this lawyer. Uh, well, first of all, you have the 70, and they come back. You know, it's, Jesus has sent them out, and they come back, and um, basically they're just all excited. They're just so excited. Why are they excited? You know, Jesus sent out the 70, and they're excited because verse 20, uh, it says, well, verse 19, Behold, I give you, unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Luke 10, verse 19. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not. I just want to stop there for a second. I think one of the problems with human nature, one of the problems that I've had for 35 years in ministry, one of the problems that I see in the Adventist church is that we aren't following that instruction. That the power that God gives us is what we rejoice in. We rejoice that God is blessing us and casting out devils and powerful sermons and look at this and look at that. Look what this guy's doing. Look what that guy's doing. And Jesus told us, don't rejoice in that stuff. That's not what you rejoice in. When Jesus was on the earth and he did stuff like that, you know what he would do? He would literally disappear. Like we want to step into the limelight because of what God is doing through us. And Jesus is like, I'm out of here. I got to go pray. <laughs> Because human nature, I know human nature. And I know what human nature naturally tends toward. And so I'm going to go pray. One of his greatest miracles, the resurrection of Lazarus. He's gone. He's just gone. They couldn't find him. Read it in Desire of Ages. He was gone. Where was he? He was praying. Father, help me to stay humble, to stay connected. Help me because I know there's some major trials coming up. I know what this is going to do and the impact it's going to have. I know what jealousy and envy does. You know, the more God uses us and the more power he works through us, the greater the enmity and the hatred of Satan. It grows and he's got new plans and new plots. And sometimes the reason why men fall so fast and so hard is because they've been exalted so high. And if we could just stay low, just stay low. And so Jesus says, don't rejoice. Don't, do not rejoice. In this, But then he goes on. It's really powerful. I love this. It's beautiful. He says, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. How do our names get written in heaven? Now, hold on to that because we're going to look at that as we close out in the book of Daniel. We're going to look at that. Don't rejoice over the power. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So that's a little bit of the context. Then in verse 25, a certain lawyer stood up to tempt him. So here's some more context, okay? And this lawyer, of course, asks him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And then he points to the commandments. But in that context, verse 29, the lawyer willing to justify himself. So you've got the disciples who are naturally tending to self-exaltation, rejoicing in the power of God instead of just focusing on the fact that their names are written in heaven. Then you've got people like the lawyer who are trying to tempt Christ and even after Christ answers the question, they're trying to justify themselves. And in that context, Christ tells the story of the Good Samaritan, a beautiful 
beautiful illustration of the plan of salvation. Because Christ is that certain Samaritan that was rejected and, and he came to us where we were and he saw us half dead, you know, spiritually dead, physically alive, and he put us on his own beast, which beast represents a kingdom. You know, he's put us on his own kingdom, took us to the inn, the church, take care of him, gave him enough money, two pence, you know, and then he said, and I'll be back. And if there's anything else you pay, you, you spend on, I'll, I'll re- recompense you. So he says all of that, and then here's where we're getting into our story. He's done dealing with his disciples and with the lawyer and with all of the temptation and all of the you know, justification. And then he and it says in verse 38, Now it came to pass, as they went, everyone's leaving, that he, Christ, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And there's nothing that Christ appreciated more than some good old hospitality. Just to, to get away from the crowds, maybe even take a little break from the disciples, and just to spend some time with some people who really loved him and wanted to take care of him. Just to get away for a little while. Just a little respite. And so he was happy to go to the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And he would just hang out with them and eat some good home-cooked food and, and get a good rest and get rejuvenated. And they would take care of him, especially Martha. She really took care of him. Check this out. She's just, she's just on this, right? So it says, and verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary, which also was just doing something weird, was, was sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. I mean, you know, Martha's like, there's so much stuff to do. Why are you just sitting there at Jesus' feet? We got work to do. We got things to accomplish, right? And Martha was, was cumbered. That's what the King James says. She was overwhelmed. She just had so much on her plate. You ever felt that way? She was completely, yeah, for a while, never. About her, I heard that. About much serving and came to him and said, Lord, don't you care about me? Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve you alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Woo! So I want you to see the picture here. You've got two Women. Now, what does a woman represent in the Bible? Church. church. You've got two churches. One church is all about serving who? Jesus. We're doing stuff for Jesus. We're doing all these works for Jesus. And the other woman is all about what? Sitting at the feet of Jesus and taking in his word. By the way, when you sit with Jesus and you take in his word, does it produce works? Is there transformation that takes place? You can't sit at Jesus' feet and and be the same person, can you? No, it changes you. So, in a sense, Martha has the cart before the horse. You know that old phrase we use? And Mary's, she's got it figured out. I need to sit at the feet of Jesus. I need to sit at the feet of Jesus. But here's where the rub is right here. The woman, Martha, tells Jesus what to do. That's what religion does when they fail to sit at Jesus' feet and take in his word. Religion tells other religious people what to do. Martha wants Mary to do her bidding. And Martha is so bold that she takes it upon herself to tell God to tell her what to do. That's what happens. That's what we see in Revelation 13, isn't it? We're seeing that whole replay take place. And what God is saying to us this evening, I believe, is that, you know, we identify the beast. We say this beast represents, you know, this system, this religious system that's going to enforce enforce its worship, et cetera, et cetera. But the beast represents more than that. Because sometimes, you know, we like to say, we like to, to, we feel safe when we say, this beast represents that religious system, that church, and I'm in this church. 
But what this story is telling us is, unless you're sitting at the feet of Jesus and taking in his word, you're in that church. (laughs) Because that system represents the natural human heart. It's just an outworking of our natural tendency from Cain all the way down through time. And that's why so many of us, we're told, are going to leave in the end of time because we haven't been sitting at the feet of Jesus. We've been cumbered about much serving, thinking that we're doing God's work, but completely void of drinking in the presence of our personal Savior. It's the latest seen condition. He's knocking at the door. He wants to come in and sup with us. He wants to have supper with us. He wants to feed us. And some of us are starving. You know how that is when you get hungry, but you're in denial? Uh, have you experienced that? I experience that all the time. Recently, my wife's like, it's time for lunch. I'm like, okay, I'll be there in a minute. You know, I've got a project that I'm working on in the garage. I've got to get it done. I'm just about finished. Are you coming? I'm not really hungry. <laughs> my stomach's growling. <laughs> a lot of us are growly Christians, you know? We're growly Christians doing this work for God, and our stomachs are growling. And people hear that growl. We're mean. We're ornery. We're losing it because we haven't been sitting at the feet of Jesus. But we're camouflaged by all the work we're doing. You know, we go to church on the right day and we study our Sabbath school and we give our tithes and we follow this and we do that. We've got all those works out there, so we're completely camouflaged. We're so camouflaged that we have deceived ourselves. It's not in our learning. It's not in our works. It's not. The secret of success for the Christian is feeling our insufficiency, inefficiency, and following Jesus. That's the secret. And the book of Revelation is faithful to that truth, to the very end. And so Martha says to God in human flesh, Lord, (laughs) Don't you care about me? See, right there, she's doing this thing, this manipulation thing. Oh, me, oh, my. Oh, poor me. Look at my situation. Don't you care about me? I'm so thankful that God can't be manipulated. I know I can be. I know we can be, right? But God can't be. Like, And don't you care about me? Look at her. Look what she's doing. You bid her. You tell her to help me. And that's the way God is outlining for us, the way we process when we don't sit at the feet of Jesus. Now, I love the way that Jesus responds. I love it. This is, this is biblical psychology 101. You ready for this? It's so beautiful. Basically, he says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. Now, stop right there. How do you think he's saying that? Just compassion and love, right? Martha, Martha. And then he just empathizes with her. You are troubled. You are careful and troubled about so many things. I get it. You're overwhelmed. He's empathetic, right? He's he's respectful. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't get indignant. What do you mean, ordering me up? Don't you know who I am? I'm the son of God. What do you? No, he totally empathizes, respects her. But I love this. He's also assertive. He doesn't compromise. He's assertive and protective of his church. But one thing is needful. Verse 42. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. That's all you need to do. According to this story, we choose the good part, and it won't be taken away. We choose the good part, and Jesus will defend us. But he doesn't do it arrogantly. He doesn't do it angrily. He empathizes. He's respectful. He doesn't rail on Martha. Now remember what Martha represents. She represents the church, right? That's, that's trying to order Christ about and tell us what to do. He, respectful, empathy, but assertive. 
protective. Mary has chosen that good part, that one thing that is important. So we have it in Revelation 14, and now we have it in Luke chapter 10. And what do we have? The one thing that's important, the one thing that God instructs his people to do. And what is that? Follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Even if your sister, even if the other church is overwhelmed and trying to order you about and trying to force you to do things and calling on the Lord to force you to stop doing that, don't do it. Don't do it. You've chosen that good part. Stay sitting at the feet of Jesus. That doesn't mean we, we're, we're so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. You, you understand what I'm saying here, right? We're not communicating here that you, shouldn't, you should just drop everything earthly. We're saying that Jesus needs to be central to everything that we do. We need, to squeeze, we need to have an agenda that brings him into all of it. We've got to plan out our days and our weeks. If we've got something that's distracting us from Christ, we need to sit down in our war room, our prayer room, and we need to attack that. We need to strategize. We need to figure out, how can I squeeze this out? And, and the best way to squeeze it out is to squeeze Jesus in. How can I get Jesus in here more? I don't want a clean house only. Because when you clean out the house, guess what happens? Seven more devils come. And it's, your state is worse than before, right? I don't want to just clean out the house. I want Jesus in the house. So when the devil knocks, Jesus answers the door. So we see this in the book of Revelation. It's our final message in Revelation. But I think there's a, a powerful connection here. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, connect with Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. And we don't always make that connection. Sometimes we read Revelation 14, 6 through 12, three angels' messages, as an, a separate message, like here's the three angels' messages. But we don't necessarily read Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Sometimes we read Revelation 14, 1 through 5, but we don't really go into Revelation 14, 6 through 12. But I think they are vitally connected together. Those who follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes are those who give to the world the everlasting gospel. Paul talks about this a little bit. And remember, we're going, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. We're, we're connecting the rest of the Bible with the book of Revelation because we want ourselves and we want others to realize that the book of Revelation is, I call it affectionately, the fifth gospel. The fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Revelation. They're all talking about Jesus. It's the fifth gospel. The book of Revelation is not primarily a revelation of the beast. It's not a revelation of the dragon. It's not a revelation of the seven last plagues. It's not even a revelation of the close of probation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And if we would change our mindset and start thinking that way, I think we would see a lot more Jesus in there. The lamb is the first symbol that's introduced in the book of Revelation. And what's really interesting is John wrote the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. They tried to boil him, you know, kill him in a, in, a, in a vat of boiling oil. And he didn't die because God had another book for him to write. <laughs> and so he goes to the Isle of Patmos. He's banished there. He writes the book of Revelation. God comes to him. Jesus comes to him. He gets this book of Revelation. But do you know that John was eventually released from the Isle of Patmos? And do you know he wrote another book after he left the Isle of Patmos? He wrote the Gospel of John. And one of the first things that he identifies in the Gospel of John that is not identified in any other of the other three Gospels, John chapter 1, verse 29. You know what it is, right? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. 29 times in the book of Revelation that symbol is used. It is central to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is all about the Lamb. When you think of the Lamb, though, what do you think of? Because the way the lamb is introduced in the book of Revelation, in chapter 5, is the lamb slain in the midst of the throne. So the, the, the lamb in Revelation is actually a symbol of the cross. It's a symbol of Calvary. Whenever you read the lamb in Revelation, you're talking about 
Calvary. You're talking about the cross. And because that lamb symbol is all through the book of Revelation, it's got to be the gospel. <laughs> when you get to Revelation 14 and it says they have the everlasting gospel, you just got to click it all the way back to the lamb slain in the midst of the throne. They're talking about Jesus. They're lifting up Jesus. And when Jesus gets lifted up, you learn to fear God. When Jesus gets lifted up, you learn how to give glory to God. When Jesus gets lifted up, you worship God. When Jesus gets lifted up, you're ready for the hour of judgment because you have an advocate, a vindicator in God. You have good news to share with the world who are scared to death of judgment and everything else that follows. They're scared of God. You've got good news. Why? Because according to Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll just look at one verse because we're running low on time. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses or in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, verse 6, and has raised us up together and made us what? Sit together in Christ in heavenly places. I mean, we're in heavenly places when we receive Christ as our Savior. And so these people that follow the Lamb wherever that He goes are then, are then described in Revelation 14, 6 as flying in the midst of heaven because they're in heavenly places with Christ. Do you see that connection? And what are they sharing? They're sharing Ephesians chapter 2. They're sharing how that we were want, once disobedient. And you read the verses here. According, you know, in time past, we worked according to the course of the world. Verse 2, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, in whom we had our conversation in times past, with the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved and he has put us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's why Revelation chapter 12 identifies God's people as those who overcome, verse 11, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. This is their testimony. This is the testimony in Ephesians chapter 2. And they love not their lives unto the death. They don't care about themselves anymore. You know, we think, oh, I'm going to be a martyr for Jesus. It's talking about self-denial. It's talking about husbands, do some dishes for your wives. That's loving not your life under the death. I know, because my wife works a 40-hour job, and I work a part-time pastor, and so I'm cleaning the house. And every once in a while, I think, that's my wife's job. And I think, wait a minute, she's working a full-time job. I'm here at home. Do the dishes, James. Do the laundry. Clean the kitchen. My wife comes home, and she says, Honey, thank you so much. You love me. <laughs> I said, oh, don't get used to it, but then I do it again and again and again, because you know, oh, it's hard for us as humans. It's hard for us to die to self unless we choose to sit at the feet of Jesus. And if we will sit at the feet of Jesus, everything else will fall into place. And Satan knows this. Satan knows this. And that's why he wants to do everything he can to stop us from having that experience. Let's wrap it up in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1. We'll just look at a couple more verses here. This chapter is the consummation of the prophecies of Daniel. It's probably the one of the most vital chapters that we're going to find. This chapter and this verse is just like Revelation 14. It's God's instruction for His people. We don't understand Daniel 12. We don't. We haven't gotten it. We're all about prophecy, all about end time events, and we're missing a key component, a vital part of instruction. Like Noah, build the ark. Lot, get out. Wise men, don't go back to Herod. End time church, Revelation, or Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which stands for the children of thy people. This is the close of probation. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. Whew. We can't even fathom it. 
Sometimes we, oh, trouble is worse than anticipation. Not so with the time of trouble. Not so. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Woo, did you know that? Did you know that not one of God's people is going to lose their life after probation closes? Did you know that? None of us are going to die. None of us are going to be martyred. There's no reason for it. Martyrdom is a testimony, a witness of the truth. Don't need that anymore. Probation's closed. Every one of God's people are going to be delivered. Everyone that is what? Found written in the book. Remember what Jesus told his disciples? Don't rejoice over your power. Don't rejoice over all the things I'm doing through your ministry. Don't rejoice over that. What do you rejoice over? Names. That your names are written in the book. Amen. Well, how do we get our names written in the book? We baptized Adventists, like, join the church, like that's the book, like the church rolls? Malachi chapter 3. Last scripture that we'll look at, Malachi chapter 3, just over a few pages. This is an amazing description of where we are. Malachi chapter 3. Two minutes and 54 seconds. Verse 15. Now we call the proud happy. That's the way the world, right now, proud people, oh, that's what I want. Yea, that they that work wickedness are set up, and they that tempt God are even delivered. That's the society we're living in today. It's all upside down. So what are we supposed to do in all of this? Verse 16, then they that feared the Lord, fear God and give glory to him, they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name, his character. I love this because when you look at the context of this, I looked up this word Um, they that feared the Lord spake. Often that phrase means to arrange. And again, I just want to go back to, we need to arrange our life, we need to arrange our schedules so that we can talk about the Lord and think about the Lord. Often. Just rearrange everything. You You want reformation? You want revival? Come to this weekend. You want reformation? Arrange your life so that you think about and talk about Jesus. Just, just, just rearrange. Whatever you have to do, just rearrange. Get up earlier, whatever. Get on audiobook. Okay, you can get it for six ninety five for the first three months, and then you have to pay fifteen bucks. But hey, you get the books. You get to listen to them. You can get your nine Spirit of Prophecy books one a month, and then when you got them all, you can get off, and you know you can just you just have them. I have them permanently. Rearrange. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. And that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son. That serves him. And then you'll return and you'll discern between the righteous and the wicked. We can't figure it all out right now. We can't figure out all the conspiracy theories right now. We don't know if Trump is good or bad for the nation. We don't know what's really going on in all this political arena because there's people moving behind the scenes and we don't know what their agenda is and we'll never figure it out. Someday we'll be able to discern it all. But right now what we need to do is think about the Lord. And talk often one to another about the Lord. And follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And sit at the feet of Jesus. And resist the the influence to do otherwise. Do you want to make that commitment tonight as we close out this weekend? I call it a Daniel fast. Just 10 days. If you're into media, if you're into CNN, if you're into all that stuff, just 10 days. Shut it all off. No more food of Babylon, no more wine of Babylon for 10 days. Just shut it off for 10 days. Can you do it for 10 days? You know, if you can't do it for 10 days, you're really in trouble. Like, deep. Just 10 days. And let God work with that. He'll work with that. He'll work with that. Father in heaven, thank you so much tonight for vital end time instruction, for guiding our hearts and our minds in Daniel and Revelation and in the Gospels, in the writings of Paul, to sit with Christ in heavenly places, to partake of the Gospel that will seep out from every pore in our being, that will take over every fiber of our being, and that will cause us to fall in love with Jesus and to, and to, to see Him as more precious than anything this world has, just like Mary did as she sat at His feet, first at the tomb, first to proclaim a risen Savior. Cast out the devil's father. All seven of them. Every one. 
and fill us with your spirit. Don't leave the house empty, please. You know the hearts of every person. You know the struggles they're going through. Send your spirit right now to convict and draw us to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And let the church say
Wow. Praise the Lord. And you're all still here. God is good. Hasn't this been a great weekend? I tell you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what he's done. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Jim Anderson for opening up his church. I want to thank uh, all the speakers, James and uh, Elder Gallimore, Ron Kelly, uh, Tim Saxton's local. And I won't thank myself for being here. Uh, Neville, thank you so much for coming all the way from Florida to play your music. And I want to thank uh, everybody up on top there who's just been, you know, they've been pulling their hair out. It's been very stressful for them, especially when the internet went down and a lot of people were praying, Lord, bring it back. And uh, thank the Lord that we came back on a minute before Ron Kelly spoke this afternoon. So God has been in this. He's been here. I want to thank you for coming, all the people that have brought food, helped with the organization of just so many things. And we really hope that you've been blessed, that you've been inspired, that you've been encouraged, that you have a clear understanding of what's coming, and that you've been uh, encouraged that Jesus is going to bring us through. He's going to bring his people through. Thank you, James, for leaving the warm weather as well. And I didn't mention that James is now pastoring the Fall Creek Seventh-day Adventist Church. So he has a church that he's ministering to and will continue to minister as we all will by the grace of God. So I'd like to uh, have a little season of prayer before we just say good night. And after that, also, we do have uh, Neville CDs that are out there. And I was just informed that White Horse Media has more books that just came. Our big, great controversies have been disappearing. So Tim made a quick trip to our headquarters and came back with a lot more. So those are there. So why don't we kneel together and pray and, and just ask God to be with us and strengthen us and then he'll use this whole weekend to, uh, to speak to many people's hearts. This whole series has been, this weekend has been recorded. Uh, I believe that's all correct. Are we up on the top there? Thumbs up? Yes. Praise the Lord. This has all been recorded. It'll all be on our YouTube channel that you can watch for free and share with others. It'll also be available on DVD uh, as soon as we can get that done. And let's just pray that Jesus will continue to guide our lives. Dear Father, Father in heaven, thank you so much for, for bringing us all here to this, this wonderful weekend here in Newport, Washington. What a blessing. You've spoken through the speakers and through the music. Many different people have contributed in so many different ways to this event. Those on the cameras, those up on the, at the, at the sound, the technical side of this. Uh, and I, I, don't, I just can't mention everybody, Lord, but you know everyone that has prayed for this weekend. And God, we just thank you. We know that Satan is a roaring lion and he hates the work of, uh, of God and the work of your people. And Lord, we pray that, that what has happened here will continue to ripple out around the world, that people will be inspired and impressed. The time is running out and that your people need to prepare for the crisis and to know what to do when it hits and to give the final cry, the cry of love, the cry of truth, the cry about the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath, and above all, the cry that Jesus gave on the cross when he said, Father, Father, it is finished. And into your hands I commit my spirit. And Lord, we look forward to seeing our Savior, to following the Lamb and seeing Jesus come in the clouds. We want to get out of this world. We're tired of of living down here with all of the evil and the sin and the temptations and the problems. And, and we pray that you will transform us into the image of Christ and that you will work through us and through your church to reach a lost world, to help them to know you before it's too late. God, please bless us all. Give us uh, safety as we travel back to our homes. Use us as we share with others as we try to reach hearts with the love of God and with the truth of your word. Bless all the ministries that are represented here. Uh, 
Jesus, we just surrender our lives to you. We are in your hands. Give us the Holy Spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Prepare us for the latter rain. May your word live in our hearts. And Lord, uh, take the reins into your hands and finish the work through your people ultimately so we can we can go home home to heaven and see you make all things new hallelujah thank you lord we pray this in the name of jesus christ our savior we love you jesus thank you for everything you've done in jesus name 